Non-experiments. Years ago, Netflix hosted a competition. Back at that time, and even to this day, Netflix tries to guess how much you will like a movie. And back then, they used a five-star rating. And so Netflix offered a cold mill, translation, $1 million, to whoever could improve their algorithm by 10%. Meaning they were looking for an algorithm that predicted your rating of a movie better than their current algorithm by at least 10%. And how would you do that? Well, Netflix's idea was to use movies that you liked in the past to predict movies you will like in the future. Or in other words, our independent variable is existing movies and our dependent variable is future movies and teams around the world competed. Even I competed. As a young, arrogant graduate student, I thought, surely I will win this competition because nobody has ever thought of doing a singular value decomposition on this data. Right. And then a month after I started analyzing the data set, guess what? Somebody improved the algorithm by 10% and the competition was closed. Otherwise, I totally would have won. So this right here is a non-experimental study. Remember, experimental studies have the following characteristics. Micra, manipulation, control, random assignment. The movies people were watching were not manipulated. Netflix didn't force those people to watch those movies, they chose themselves. And people weren't randomly assigned to watch movies. Non-experiments lack these characteristics. Instead, they tend to measure the variables as they naturally occur. Because they lack these characteristics of experiments, the evidence they have for causality is much weaker. So if it weakens our causal claim, why would you even use them? Well, there's four reasons. First, it might not be possible, ethical, or feasible to randomly assign people. You can't manipulate someone's age. Can't turn back the clock in time, people! You can't ethically assign people to start smoking. It is not feasible to manipulate the school district in which students are placed. But you still might be interested in how these variables relate to some sort of an outcome variable. Second reason is it is way easier. You just have to measure things that already exist. So there's much less of a need to worry about having to control things. And you don't have to worry about random assignments. Number three, to generate hypotheses. Sometimes doing non-experimental research allows us to test a hypothesis before we bother going through all that effort to do an experiment. So non-experimental studies are kind of like a trial run before we actually go through the effort to do a real experiment. And number four, they tend to be higher in external validity. So our ability to infer causation from non-experimental studies is much weaker. Or in other words, internal validity is pretty weak, but external validity tends to be much higher. So for example, the Netflix data set that has pretty high external validity. This is actual movie watching behavior from actual users of Netflix. And in addition, it is a random sample of all Netflix users. So we have ridiculously high external validity here. Within non-experimental, we have two categories. Now your book says three, but really it's just two categories. Believe me, I know more than the book authors. The first is correlational or cross-sectional research. And this, the book combined, but really the way that people talk about them in the literature, they're basically the same thing. Now, according to your book, correlational means that we are studying the relationship between two numeric variables, like stress and anxiety. Whereas, according to your book, a cross-sectional design studies the relationship between a grouping variable and a numeric outcome, like smoker versus non-smoker and certain health outcomes. But this isn't a necessary distinction, and it's not a distinction I've seen anywhere else. And in the literature, people use these terms interchangeably. So I'm going to lump them. Cross-sectional and correlational research are basically the same thing. These sorts of studies simply measure the variables as they naturally occur. So they might measure age, socioeconomic status, gender, income, depression, number of subscribers, S&P 500, batting average. All these things are measures that can naturally occur. Some of these variables are publicly available, such as somebody's batting average or the number of subscribers. And some of these variables must be disclosed by participants, such as depression and age. But none of these variables are manipulated. And the information we glean from these studies can be used for multiple reasons, including prediction. Like with the Netflix data set, we're trying to predict somebody's rating of a movie they haven't seen yet. And to a lesser extent, explanation, which means that we can use this information from this study to generate hypotheses for future experimental research. Or we could use advanced statistical methods and provide some stronger evidence for causality. The second category is observational studies. With observational studies, we make observations without any sort of manipulation. And often this means data are collected qualitatively. So we might, for example, describe themes or describe responses and behaviors and that sort of thing. So an ethnography or a case study is a good example of an observational study. These often yield very rich information that is difficult to condense. And unfortunately, we won't go much into qualitative research and observational studies. Not because they're not important. I think they're ridiculously important. I wish I knew how to do qualitative research, but I don't. And that is beyond the scope of this class anyway. So let me make one final comment. Experiments are high in internal validity, but low in external validity. Non-experiments are high
high in external validity, but low in internal validity. Wouldn't it be nice if there's a way to have both internal and external validity? Oh boy, there is! How? By converging evidence across multiple studies. I really hope you guys have memorized that phrase by now. Are you sensing the theme here? Let's say we want to observe the effect of eating vegan on somebody's probability of getting cancer in the future. What we could do is we could start out by sampling vegans and non-vegans and look at the incidences of cancer. But this is ridiculously weak in internal validity because we don't know if it's veganism or if it's just their lifestyle that reduces their chances of getting cancer. So then you follow this up with an experiment. Maybe you randomly sample 5,000 people and randomly assign them to either eat vegan or have a good sham control condition, maybe like the keto diet or something. And then we would follow them for years or decades and see which group suffers a lower incidence of cancer. And so that would have high internal validity. And then what? Then we would replicate. Because maybe in the last experiment, a lot of people dropped out. So maybe in the next experiment, we try really, really hard to control for that dropout and keep doing it over and over and over and over again. Because here's the thing, one study is very poor evidence of any finding. But if you have five studies, 10 studies, 20 studies, 100 studies saying the same thing, guess what? That is ridiculously strong evidence. That's what we should strive for. So replicate. Converging evidence across multiple studies. That's what it's about. So with that, let's review our learning objectives. Number one, characteristics of non-experimental studies. They just lack the characteristics of experiments. Manipulation, control, random assignment. Number two, reasons for doing non-experimental research. Well, it's not practical, feasible, or ethical to do a manipulation. Easier to do. We can use them to generate hypotheses for later experimentation, and it tends to increase external validity, but at the expense of internal validity. Number three, the two categories of non-experimental research. One is cross-sectional or correlation research and two is observational research and then four converging evidence across multiple studies specifically within this context each type of a design is going to be strong in one area and weak in other areas and so that's why we do multiple studies so that we could address the limitations of the previous study and sacrifice some of the strengths of the former study so with that I'll see you next time